Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of February 21st, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at approximately 7.05 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. This planning board meeting is being held in person in the town room at town hall. However, we are conducting this as a hybrid meeting and members of the planning board and members of the public are also able to attend via Zoom. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, the planning board has been given authority to hold meetings via Zoom. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. In-person attendance of the public is permitted at tonight's meeting. However, there is limited capacity in the town room due to the COVID pandemic. The capacity of the town room is limited to 40 people, including the planning board members and staff. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and if you are participating remotely, return to mute. Bruce Coldham. Here. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman is absent. Uh, that was what we were told in advance. And Karen went here. Great, thank you board members and welcome to the town room. I, for some of you, this is your first planning board meeting ever in person. And for somebody like me, it's the first one in probably three years or two years, it must be two years. We had one. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, it's nice to see you all in person, as well as the staff who are here with us. We have Chris Brestrup, we have Nate Malloy, Pam Field Sadler, and Sean, whose last name I forget. Tom, Sean Karen, yeah. Hannon, thank you. Okay, board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. For those participating remotely, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. Um, I, will, I may see your request. I can't assure you of that because I'm looking at paper rather than a screen tonight. Um, and we're not really planning to have very much public comment. Um, after speaking, assuming I do see your request and call on you to speak, after speaking, remember to remute yourself. Planning board members who are present in the town room should also raise their hands when they wish to speak. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited or raise your hand if you are present in the town room. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or ex exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the time, at least on my watch, is 7.09, and we'll have a public comment period at this point. Um, I don't have a screen. We have three attendees, but I don't see any hands raised on the screen. 
All right, I see one public person in the room with their hand raised. Janet, could you hand them the second microphone? Oh, Sean has it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thank you for letting me be here in, in person. Um, I had a couple questions as you cogitate over your task tonight. And um, one of my questions is, if we're thinking about the um, densification in the um, residential village centers or business village centers, um, do we have an, a, an account of which parcels are actually containing historic structures? Um, if you're looking around town and thinking about townhouses, what are appropriate areas for locations of townhouses or townhouse clusters? And thirdly, where would, where would duplexes most likely be built? We haven't seen a huge number of them. Would they be, would they be perhaps add-ons to existing buildings or would they be teardowns and new construction? So as you're, as you're dealing through that, um, it might be handy to talk about those. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, I don't see any other hands, so we'll go on at 711 to planning for housing growth. All right, the main topic for this evening was item two here, planning for housing growth. Uh, and this in-person meeting was a chance for us uh, on the board to huddle around maps of town and talk about where the town might be able to allow additional housing beyond what's here now. Uh, I'll remind you, uh, we're trying to all talk into a microphone this evening so that people at home and on the recording can hear us. So if you wanna speak, I guess, raise your hand physically uh, and uh, we'll pass you one of the, the two microphones. Sean, is it true that when one microphone is on, the other one will not operate? No, they, should both. they should both operate at once. Okay. All right, great. I thought mine wasn't working when Pam was speaking earlier. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm more or less responsible for this, for having this meeting tonight, since I'm the one that at one of my uh, chair reports said, hey, you know, I had some thoughts about where we could increase, allow, our, our, allow additional dimensional, at least housing, and would anybody be interested in that? So the first, the second time I said that was the night that we first heard Mandy Joe and, and uh, Pat DeAngelis's zoning amendment, and I thought, my suggestion would die and we could really only handle one thing at a time. Much to my surprise, you guys seemed more enthused than, than I was expecting. So um, here we are. Um, and I, I know that Chris kind of used this as the beginning of what might be a multi-part conversation. It's not like we're gonna be deciding anything tonight. Um, so I guess I could just start by laying out a couple of things that I have had been musing about. Um, and there were basically three areas that I was interested in. Um, one was north of the university, not immediately north, but up in the RN, um, west of North Pleasant Street. So kind of in the area, let's see, this is a hard map to Okay. Okay, yeah, and this, that's North Village. So I was thinking of this area up here where, where Puffton Village and Brandywine are now, um, kind of on this, this whole corner. Um, and the, re the reason I wondered about it is it's fairly low density housing now, and it's all from like the 70s. And uh, so it's one and two stories, uh, it has a mix of undergraduate housing, of 
residents, it has graduate student residences, residents with families. It probably has some low income family, uh, you know, occupants. Um, but it seemed like right now it's housing, rental housing that has some students and not. And who would object, I suppose, you know, part of this was what could we do that we wouldn't arouse vociferous op op opposition to because we're we seem to have a lot of that. <laughs> so that was one area. And um, do all of you, are all of you familiar with that, that kind of area? Um, so- Do you mean we're in North, North Village? North of North Village. North of North Yeah, Village. and I mean, Presidential is right here where, where the, uh, Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the university's North Village area that they just are rebuilding. So just south of that is a private parcel that's that's called Presidential One and Two, I think. And then north of it is Puffton Village. Over to this area is Brandywine towards Route 216. And then there's another private housing right along Meadow Street. Yeah, I forget what that one's called. Townhouse, is that what it's called? Okay, so so those are all kind of, you know, they're already housing, they could be denser. It's kind of what I wondered. And then on the opposite side of the street, there is, what's the name, somebody's lane? Hobart, Hobart Lane, um, you know, and, you know, would we wanna extend, you know, would we wanna limit it to those areas that are currently multifamily housing? Um, or would we want to nibble, nibble at the edges a little bit and maybe go a little farther? Um, one thing that, that kind of struck me when we were talking about Mandy Joe's uh, proposal, there is no multifamily apartment housing zone in Amherst. And isn't that kind of weird? Um, you know, one of the things when I first met, mentioned this to this area to Chris, of, few months ago at, at least, she said, well, you know, the building inspector views it as non-conforming and therefore it could continue and maybe continue to be equally non-conforming and that you could actually build more there according to the building inspector than is there now without any change of zoning. But that's not clear to people who are actually looking at the town zoning and it's not clear to, maybe even to the landlords who, who own those parcels. Uh, Chris has her hand raised. Hello. So it's already been done in two places. One is presidential. Um, we looked at that, and that is non-conforming. It's in, I think, the RN zoning district, and they applied for a special permit under Section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to expand a non-conforming use. So that was a number of years ago. The other one is um, down in South Amherst. I think it's the Boulders or South Point. I can never remember which is which, but one of them is going to have a new building built there and under the same um, section of the bylaw, the 9.22, they got a special permit to add a building with 47 units. So the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Building Commissioner are both open to that idea. And I think others, other landowners in town have made um, inquiries about doing that kind of thing. Now it just came on. Um, thank you, Chris. Janet. Um, so most of Amherst can have multifamily housing. So like all RN can have duplexes or triplexes or quadplexes, depending on the lot size. And so, you know, so that's already there. But I think I, my question is like, so you're, I think what you're suggesting and just is taking existing apartment complexes and rezoning them for more density in, and that's what this one would be. And yeah. so, you know, and I under, I support that, um, especially since I think the 9.22 is kind of this constant twisting of it. And why not just say, this is where we want apartment houses. We want them to three stories. 
you know, closer together as long as there's, there's amenities. And so people, so it just, it's like where we want to put. Right. And you know, so, it, so it would be, so is that what even you're though this yeah. section 9.22 or whatever exists already, creating a zone that says, here's where we want multifamily apartment to happen would communicate more effectively to the development community that we're open to some, some things that maybe that it's not so obvious right now. So by rezone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chris, I see your hand again. So one of the problems seems to be, and Nate and I discussed this a lot, which is that um, property owners who are already making money on their property are reluctant to forego that money for a period of years, which it would take to build something in order to then be able to reap higher benefits. And there, were, um, there, were, there was talk about this in the housing market study. And I think the conclusion of the consultants there was that you'd have to build um, between three and five times the number of units that are existing on the property in order to make it worthwhile to, to the landowner for them to uh, go forward with such a, a process. So I just right. wanted to mention that. Yep, if you have a property that's fully paid off your monthly income is is heavily profit, and how would you even equal or, or gain that if you took out a new mortgage to build something new? So maybe you know, maybe that doesn't have legs. I'm not a developer, but that was one area that I thought of. The second one was down along University Drive, uh, south of Amity Street, and I know there's been some housing built along there. That one, the one University Drive was built, um, and then what? Seventy University, I think, was the other one that was recently done, just south of that new restaurant, uh, Savannah's, right? Um, so that that was an area where there weren't a lot of residential abutters who might be uh, objecting to allowing housing. Um, right now, it's basically commercial, uh, you know, the big Y is there, you've got all the medical stuff in the corner uh, uh, with at Route 9, uh, then there's what the post office, then all the, the pot shops along there. Um, but, you know, I know you, you, if you, if we wanted to, we could do, say, an overlay district along there that would allow, add housing as an op opportunity along there um, if it were relatively urban in its configuration, close to the street and, you know, four or five stories, you, you, you could have kind of a new downtown down there. And it's a pretty straight shot up University Drive to the university. Um, I know there's that one, what is it, the Alpine Heights or whatever on Route 9 that, you know, that, that's a lot of students. And somehow they get on with a uh, shuttle bus, I think a lot of them come up to UMass and back. So there's also pretty good bus service there. And if you had an apartment there, you could walk to Big Y and back and you wouldn't need a car. Um, you could bicycle up University Drive to, to the university. So that seemed like an area with reasonable amenities in terms of having the supermarket and some medical stuff that you could probably operate without a car if you lived in that area. So that was the second one. And, um, and then the third one is, I'm sure, the most controversial. And it's, um, so I'll, I'll mention it, but I don't expect us, I, I expect a couple of you to object to it right off the bat. Um, and that is the west side of Kendrick Park. Um, that, that stretch of uh, housing between, say, McClellan and Triangle Street. Um, you know, I realize that there's uh, resistance to that in the adjacent neighborhood, but um, you know, those from a sort of developer point of view, that is an area where, particularly with Kendrick Park becoming a park, um, that's like the potential to be our Boston Garden, you know, our our Boston Common. So it's it's a place where if you had pretty nice apartments along this, that, that stretch, um, I think they'd be really desirable and could be a nice place for retirees to live or, you know, 
well-off families. So those were the three that occurred to me. And I know there's been other conversation maybe with Andrew and Tom about Route 9 headed east toward Belchertown. Um, and um, whether that area should be zoned. Uh, the Route 9 stretch between, say, the Amherst College campus and East Pleasant Street, where that sort of commercial district with the kind of single story, uh, it has the, um, it's along, no, I meant East Street, between East Street and the railroad um, on Route 9, College Street, okay. College Street, yeah. where that the, the the flooring store is, that diner is, the Dunkin' Donuts is, um, you know, it's it's like the commercial district along there. I, I I suppose if we allowed a bunch of housing along there, it might push the commercial out. So I'm not sure people would want to do that. So that was kind of my intro, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I was only going to add just the, the, the area that, that Tom and I had uh, talked about, and actually several of us when we were doing a site visit, was uh, Belchtown Road going out, uh, out of town east towards Belchtown, is that there's lots of low density around here. And with East Amherst Village Center really starting to develop, that there might be an opportunity to. to... Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using the cursor on the map. Yeah, sorry for that. But um, so, you know, we had, we had recently looked at uh, this, uh, the hot pot. And when we were on that site visit, recognized that there is a, a large, really stretch of Route 9 all the way down to the, I forget the name of the old um, maple farm, that that area seemed like that would also be a great spot for upzoning. I think this is also one of the areas that was being you know, had, has been targeted for some residential growth. Um, and I think the property, I can't remember which Belchon Road number it was, but that that had been purchased. So just some more clarification on that. And that's, uh, your map is showing the Alpine Commons apartments too, which are relatively new, uh, pretty, you know, two-story maybe. Uh, yeah. And Tom. Thanks, Doug. I think one of the things we also talked about um, in reference to that particular place was kind of expanding the village center further down that road to allow for maybe some non-residential markets or other types of um, grocery-like stores that might populate that road as well, because there is quite a big food desert there for people, and it's quite a distance for them to bring their groceries on the bus all the way over there. There's lots of uh, students, there's lower income housing there, and there's a lot of density. So I think bringing that urban, uh, um, the village center further down Route 9 um, might allow for some development of, of markets or fresh produce or, or something that um, could alleviate this food desert that's in that zone. Yeah, I had plotted out where the bus routes go, and there's actually not a single bus route that goes from Route 9 all the way across Amherst. If you want to go to Stop and Shop from the Belchertown roadside, you've got to go at least up to Main Street, I don't know, maybe all the way to UMass, and then pick up a different bus. And, and many people here, I don't know if this is a, a rule, the, the drivers limit the number of grocery bags you can bring on the bus. And so people that are shopping for a family can actually get all their groceries on a bus and get them back to this neighborhood either way. So I think trying to find a way to get zone it in such a way that those types of things are more available uh, would be wise. And mm -hmm. whether or not we can encourage them to be built is another story, but at least creating the opportunity for that to happen. Okay, Janet. So one of the problems we have is we haven't delineated, delineated any village centers. And, and I think, I mean, I'm most familiar with the um, East Amherst Village Center or whatever we call it. And it's like the weirdo zoning. Like there's just, there's some parcels that have, you know, are split in two. Remember we did that one of the permits in, you know, the backyard and the parking spaces. And, it, you know, I'd love to see some sort of 
make everything easier and more flexible, like village center zoning that allows, you know, more dense housing that allows different kinds of stores. Um, you know, I would do that with design, like a process to figure out where the village center is, you know, develop design standards that people can agree on. And so we won't be like arguing building by building. But I look at colonial village apartments, you know, people, you know, there's, there's a lot of people living there, but it's very low density. And, um, you know, people have, they use the grass and they, you know, barbecue, but again, it looks like the same kind of area, very low density, it could get taller, it could get more filled in, it might be, um, so I see that for that area too. Okay, Janet, Bruce. Um, yep. Um, extending that, as you were saying, Andrew, that uh, I guess it's the, uh, Village center business is it? The, the, yeah. Yes, down uh, down. Well, I guess it would be that side, which would be the north west northeast side of uh, Route Nine. There, uh, it's currently RN. Um, if, if we were to rezoning or, or however the mechanism was rezoning or overlay, um, we did uh, when we were at that site visit. Um, um, some of us speculated on the the Maple Farm site uh, without knowing anything much perhaps about the uh, the proposed or the the, the new uh, food co-op co that's uh, gaining ground uh, in town. It, it seemed to everybody that that would be a wonderful site for that uh, type of uh, use. And, but we also recognize that it may not at this stage be able to consider that site. So um, along the lines of what you're suggesting, Andrew, making it, considering what would it take to make that beyond the willingness, of course, of the seller, um, make that a possible site for a food co-op might be something that um, would eventually be something cooperative that we can do. Uh, and I also should say that on the, the uh, Kendrick Park, the west side of Kendrick Park, just so the folks know the Local historic district, a local historic district commission is in the process of thinking about the um, the um, Lincoln Sunset uh, historic district expansion into that. So I don't know how that affects whether whether that whether, whether that would be a whether there would be some collaborative uh, synergy there or whether there would be some conflict. I don't know, but it's relevant to the conversation if we want to continue it. That that initiative is being contemplated by by the another commission in town. Uh, Chris. I was just reminded by Pam Rooney that there is a, an affordable housing development that's going in along Belcher Town Road. It's town sponsored and it's actually two locations. So you might want to look at that location and see how that fits in with the um, thought about expanding the village center down Belcher Town Road. And maybe Nate, or yes, um, yes, Andrew's pointing that out. Um, and so there's that site, and there's also the site that's on um, East Street, which is, where is that, Nate? Further north, near the East Street near School. The, near the school, right? East Street School. So those yeah. two locations are going to have up to 70 altogether 70 affordable units. Okay, uh, Janet, Janet has got her hand up. So just talking about that some more, um, there's also a new community garden that's gone in and I, it's, I'm not sure I can pinpoint it, but it's on the um, east side of Belcher Town Road near Fort River. And there's a new community garden going in there. And, um, so there's going to be a lot of low income housing, a community garden, a new school. There's a lot of synergy there. It's also got like some really good dirt. And so I could see, you know, it's a floodplain, right? It's good dirt. And it's a lot of it is very wet. I'm not sure about Colonial Village, but I can attest to a lot of wetness there. But I do think it's a great area. It could be kind of a kind of a test case for like how to put in amenities, you know, to put in a grocery store or there are some places selling food. There's Indian food being sold and then mom's market and things like that. But I, I do think this is like an area that'd be great for some kind of really good redevelopment and thinking about like who's there. And
Go ahead, Bruce. Oh, just to add to what uh, you were saying, Janet, we probably should, when we're talking about this, remember that we hope we're going to have a, a double-sized school uh, right above that red part there. Right. So that means that there'll be twice as many people coming to pick up buses. the kids and stuff like that. So that's, a, that's another augmentation, I guess. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. I was only, uh, I was also just going to point out that there is the new development happening in the southwest corner as well, which I think is ground floor retail with the Resi above. These, these comments, yeah, okay. So, yeah, residential coming in here, you know, the hot pot, the low and moderate income housing in these two areas, it does. And then the, the village center is bisected by the commercial zone here. Um, it does seem like with all of that anchored by potentially a new school, that um, we could bring some cohesion to like unify this area. Um, you know, in, another area too, which um, oops, I was also thinking of as well was just down in South Amherst, um, around just Pomeroy, our other village center, which we haven't really talked about in great detail either. There's, there's some um, undeveloped land, um, really sort of surrounding this, that there might be an opportunity. And I know at one point, and I'm not sure what the status of was, uh, what the status of this was, but there was, you know, this, the intersection was going to be redeveloped um, and potentially turned into a, a rotary or roundabout. That, um, I think that, that also makes for a really compelling kind of placemaking opportunity where this right now just feels like it's um, a stop along the road, but with a roundabout, with some densification, you might actually make a pretty compelling uh, area with lots of identity. My kids are on the Xbox. Thanks. All right, thanks, Andrew. Chris, is the roundabout project going to happen? Chris said it is. Hi everyone, Nate Malloy. I guess, you know, <clears throat> Pam Rooney asked a few questions earlier, but I feel like we've, maybe we've already just decided that, right? This is not just duplexes and triplexes, it's much denser housing. And so um, I kind of agree. And I feel like, you know, do we have it, some of it be called the student housing zone because that's what it's gonna be built unless we have some strict controls, right? So the housing market study also said, um, if you upzone some areas, have some protections in other areas. So you know, there's a balancing effect. And I mean, I like the conversation, the housing production plan looked at that section of route nine, um, the north side and had, you know, four story buildings and trying to create a streetscape there. So, you know, you could more than quadruple the density and still have it look nice. And, you know, I think that maybe we have a higher percentage of affordable units if we don't want to be students. And so, you know, the 40R downtown didn't go anywhere. And I thought that was really great. I think the gateway is a great project too, to look at again with design controls and other regulatory requirements. And so, um, but you know, I think the student demand is so great that unless we can satisfy 2000 beds, it's just gonna be students. And so a mixed use building is gonna be studios and one bedrooms is what we're seeing rented at $2,000 a month to all students and then vacant retail because the residential can subsidize it. And the owner has no incentive to put in something desirable on the ground floor for retail. So I'd like to see, you know, I like this discussion. I think we could have greater density in a lot of areas. And then let's talk about what are the details. Like I'm not even considering zoning right now because our zoning wouldn't allow this at all. So let's just figure out where we want it and then figure out how to do it. Maybe it's an overlay, maybe it's, you know, right now, right? So Amir in South Amherst or East Amherst has taken advantage of BVC, right? It's like on four parcels. It's like, well, why is there not BVC everywhere? You know, commercial doesn't allow it. If, if commercial became BVC, we'd see mixed use buildings that are four stories because we have no cap on the number of units in a mixed use building. So, you know, right now, I think there are people are taking advantage of the zoning we have by doing mixed use buildings, but if they could do it somewhere else, they would do it somewhere else. And so I think we could control it better if we do have something like Doug, you're suggesting, whether it's an overlay or we change zoning or something, so. Thanks, Nate. One, one thing I was gonna say, kind of following that, um, I have been keeping a chart of housing approved since 2010. And the total that I have is 1,504 beds since 2010. 
and uh, I've shared this with Chris every now and then, um, beds. Yeah, in terms of, you know, whether it's a studio or one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom or four bedroom. I mean, bedrooms, yeah, yeah. Some, some of those rooms will have two or whatever students in them, but um, so that's tw since 2010 and I, don't, I didn't start any earlier than that. So it starts with Boltwood Place and then Kendrick and then goes through the hot pot that we just approved. Um, and so, you know, I think the housing production plan talked about doing about equal that number kind of in the future, another couple of thousand beds. I, I don't know what the timing was. That, that was the, what you quoted today, Janet. Um, No, these are multifamily, multifamily developments. Yeah, yeah. Karen. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. So Nate, um, what I'm hearing is that we need, we want to somehow stir this spirit, be able to have some control so that we can encourage really mixed use grocery stores, retail. Um, and how do we do that? I, I'm not quite sure. What is it that we do? Yeah, I, I don't have all the answers, but I do think that right now the <laughs> residential market is so strong that it can subsidize commercial space. So, you know, developers had said they're willing to have their commercial space sit vacant for five years, knowing they can get top dollar for the residential spaces. And so, you know, I don't know what the tools are, you know, is it, it may be right non-zoning, it can be tax incentives, it can be other incentives, um, but, you know, what are the mechanisms, um, you know, it's not, I don't know, you know, I don't have the, I don't necessarily have the answers, but I think that right now what's happening is just because the resident, residential market is so strong, that's the driving factor. It's not even a consideration of what's happening with the non-residential use, right? That's just an afterthought. Okay. So do we have the power to say, to have some kind of a, a zoning where you don't have residential use? Where you well, just well, right, allow- Right now we, we have a zone, it's called the RF, the, the residential fraternity zone, which is, designated for students. Those are the only people that can live in that area. That... How, do we, how do we have uh, something like that, which is not for students and beds, but is for a grocery store or for a commercial space, which is what we need and which is not happening. How do we do that? Do we have a mechanism? Well, we can list grocery stores as a use and allow them in whatever particular zones we want to and uh, so we can allow it. We can't cause it to happen, but we can create well, can the conditions we, to allow. It. Well, can we also uh, not allow residents? In other words, this is only for this sure. kind of thing. The commercial so zone does not allow housing. Residents. Okay, so if we want in does that it, area, oh, I'm people with farms, if we want a grocery store, and we, we want to avoid what's happening, people coming in, building these things that they're primarily can considering uh, milking students for profit, then we have to zone it in that way. I guess that's the step that we have to really consider. Tom. Thanks. I mean, I think that there's two parts to that, right? One is that I think Nate's saying, we need to satisfy this demand. So we need to make a zone where we can put all the students, right? Or, or overlay zones or, or make it more I guess, affordable or possible to add density. I think on the flip side, you know, if you put 4,000 beds in Pomeroy Village Center, Mission Cantina would be overloaded with people wanting burritos. So then another burrito place might open or something else. So I think the notion of these village centers, the, the mix of commercial and and housing is problematic. I think it's problematic because we don't have the density of the housing yet. And I think if we do raise that, and, the, and that's the same with downtown, right? I mean, I think we're not filling those spaces all the time because there's, there's not enough people down there to go get those burritos. And so I do think that like places like Pomeroy, where they're somewhat isolated, we can get a mixed use to function really well there because those kids are gonna want a slice of pizza on their way up to their, you know, four-story 
tower of, of dorms that we put there. So I do think there are, you know, there are ways to do kind of both of those things in some of these zones, but I think creating the opportunities is what we want to try to accomplish. I, on that, on your example, at least, uh, you know, if you put 4,000 students at Pomeroy, we probably ought to talk to PVTA. Like, you know, somewhere in this, the, the, the public transportation system and whoever runs it probably ought to be consulted on what we're thinking about if we're really gonna, gonna create a huge amount of demand in some part of campus or some part of town that doesn't have it now. Chris. We've actually received an inquiry from a property owner or from a representative of a property owner who owns, who has the desire to develop property on the, I guess it's the north side of College Street. And we were showing that on the image before where there's, it's all commercial. And they have an idea that if a lot of that property were rezoned to business village center, that it would be much more developable for mixed use buildings. And that seems like a good, use of that property to me that more of that area should be rezoned as bvc we didn't have bvc when we put in commercial here but bvc is really more flexible than commercial so we should consider doing that would would we consider increasing the dimensional allowances for bvc even is that we could we, we could, could consider doing that yeah i don't know those off the top of my head but it's I wonder whether, similar to what happened downtown, where we added allowed another story or two to happen, whether if we did the sim something similar with BVC, would that, you know, finally get us over the threshold where something is financially feasible to invest in? Um, Chris, do you want to answer that, and then we'll go to the other hand. Yeah, you're already allowed to put three stories in BVC, and there's a special permit modification that's allowed a dimensional modification that's allowed with a footnote A, so you could have four stories in BBC. So there is already that, um, okay. you could do that. Okay, all right. Uh, I don't know, Bruce, you go next. Thanks, Doug. No, it's okay. It seems that, that uh, I've got two things to say, I guess. It seems that an unintended consequence maybe of uh, allowing the uh, five-story buildings downtown, I guess, um, would uh, it might have been that it certainly then becomes, if you were saying that, uh, more possible to do what to achieve what you're describing, which is essentially an underuse or a non use or, or, or really a, a, a very uh, not paying any attention necessarily to trying to rent out the, the lower floor. And uh, so maybe we should be a little more careful perhaps to not create the economic situations where that unintended consequence could happen. But uh, more particularly on that score, um, would we in uh, the areas that we're thinking about where housing could, and particularly student housing could be more densely uh, accommodated with say four story buildings, it would seem to me nice to be able to take that residential use right down to the first floor because then if you if you can take that residential use right down to the first floor, then you can connect the residential uses to exterior spaces. Whereas the way we've been doing it or it's been happening in the uh, downtown, of course, they're dissociated and uh, it might be really nice for that kind of housing. It would be, make it more attractive, I would imagine, to be able to um, integrate the whole building and then to uh, have, indoor, have exterior space that's connected to the living more particularly. Um, so that's a question, I guess, to Nate or Chris. Um, would there be a problem with that? Is that uh, does that require a? Is, is a presumably, that somehow that could be solved, and that 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 uh, type of housing could be accommodated in those uh, uh, that type of uh, denser housing could be accommodated. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, right now under zoning, it'd be difficult. Um, we cap a number of units in an apartment building, so. You know, we could have multiple apartments on a site that allows it to get to the ground floor, but it may not work with, say, the density or the models we're talking about. The mixed use does have the requirement of, you know, most of the street front has to be non-residential use. So I think we'd have to have some type of zoning change or flexibility there um, to achieve what you're saying. 
you know, depending on the, you know, the density. Well, it's exactly because the mixed use doesn't have the 24 unit cap that is creating the situation we have. So that if, if the apartment type, building type were allowed to have more units that was presumably more financially feasible, then you might get a, a larger apartment building that would start with the first floor and wouldn't have to do the token commercial space in order to justify the larger number of units. Yeah, depending on the location, you know, if it's a, if it's a village center where we might want to have at least some suggestion of commercial space, that's different than something, say, up, up in a already dense student area where you probably do want to have some connection to the outdoors. Okay. All right. Janet. <clears throat> So when I went back, I'm, I'm not sure I have the whole, I have the housing production plan here and it looks like we, it goes from like 20, you know, year one is 2013 and year five is 2017. And I think we definitely have hit the total number of units, um, you know, in the last 10 years. But what we haven't hit, like, you know, in year five, we were supposed to build five, 100 units of student housing. I think we've built hundreds of, you know, unit units of student housing and so I think the question is how do we make the space for non-students and so you know I've said this before I think UMass has to step up and start housing more students thousands more students because we can build 5,000 units and we'll have 4,000 filled with students and so you know I feel really strongly about that or if we're going to have you know lifting caps or increasing density we have to make space for regular folk, because that actually will build our economy too, our year round economy and kind of kind of prevent a lot of the problems we see. I have to apologize. I've read the housing production plan several years ago. And so, you know, this is a, you know, depiction of how East Amherst Village could look or Amherst Center um, in terms of density on particular lots and stuff like that. So I'd like to pass it around, you know, kind of it's been done already by our consultants. Um, you know, they were looking at three stories in the village centers and four stories in Amherst Center, but I just thought it was um, kind of like taste them again for the first time. But I really do think we have to figure out some way to control the impact of student housing on the town because we've been hearing from people and um, it's just, we just need to figure it out. I think UMass just has to step up. And I think, the, you know, the studies show that the more students who live on campus, the better it is. Like, UMass Lowell is trying to build more on-campus housing. People have better experiences. And so I, I don't think we can solve this just by zoning or you know, putting out lures for development. Because we've seen, I mean, we're in a building boom in our town. It's not like we lack for, we need to bring developers in, but we need developers that are building housing for workforce, for, for families, for just regular people. Karen. I feel very strongly the same way that uh, Janet has just expressed it. UMass has all this land. We have to think about transportation too. We wanna to get it into a pedestrian kind of a downtown. Um, UMass has so much land off of 116. They could build student centers. They could have private people come in and help them build that. They could have electric shuttles per those people to downtown but the town has to be preserved for a mix of people. And we are really faced with, here we're talking about, well, we could put students here, we could put high students there. This is UMass's problem. They've got to somehow solve not destroying the ambiance and the historic nature of the town by overwhelming us. And uh, we then they could have bicycle paths, they, they can have their own, you know, they have their dining commons and we can develop in the way that is good for everyone. So I think we should stop sort of thinking this center could be a huge, massive dormitory over at Pomeroy and then we could have it here and we could have it there. We have to somehow have a conversation with UMass. They have the land, they need to do more. Chris? 
I just wanted to mention the fact that UMass is building dorms. They're building them on Massachusetts Avenue. And part of the reason they're doing that is because the town talked to them about doing that for a long time. The town talked about a public-private partnership and it took a very long time for it to come about. It took probably 15 years or more for that to happen, but it is happening. And I guess I feel optimistic that UMass will have a good experience with that. One of the reasons UMass has told us in the past that they can't build residential, more residential units on the campus is because they have reached their bonding cap. And when their bonding cap opens up again, they'd rather spend the money on academic buildings than they would on residential buildings. So now that they have the opportunity to have public-private partnerships, I am optimistic that they can then move along to build more housing on campus. I'm not, I haven't had any conversations with them, so I don't know that that's the case, but if, if this is a successful project, I wouldn't see any reason why not. And it will bring in income to them because the people who are building these units are leasing the land from UMass. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Uh, Nate. Sure, thanks. I mean, I was actually thinking like 5,000 beds in Pomeroy, Tom. No. I no realistically, I, I'm not envisioning that at all. So again, the housing production plan had um, you know, cottage style development. Um, you know, next to Taylor Davis, there's a slobody lot that's vacant between, you know, um the transporter building and then Taylor Davis, and it's a few acres. And so it was envisioning, you know, like 40 to 50 units, cottage style, two and a half, three stories, you know, third story under a roof. Um, you know, and to me that's an appropriate development there. I think my concern is that the demand for, you know, by students for housing would overwhelm a development like that. So even if we say, wow, that's a nice scale, it can be a mix of bedroom types, it could attract all different types of people, it just, it, it'll get absorbed by students because they can pay a higher price. So even if we think it looks nice and is appropriately scaled and everything, families or non-students will have a hard time getting there. And so I think we have to talk about where can we actually allow students and have a student zone or zones, I mean, UTAC, the UTAC report identified three or four areas around university, you know, the UMass campus, one was University Drive. Let's just say it's a student zone and we're gonna allow really dense multifamily housing. And that's where we want students. And maybe in the other zones where we don't want the students, maybe we require 25% affordable, like a 40 hour district. 20 or 25% of the units have to be affordable so that can't be students. Maybe we try to risk restrict students. They're not a protected class. And we try to start encouraging other types of housing for non-students. I mean, I think it has to be a little bit of both or many different things. So I'm not envisioning, right? I don't wanna have Pomeroy Village become five-story buildings. You know, I don't think that's appropriate either in East Amherst, but I think in certain areas it may be, it can be, you know, maybe on, um, you know, up in the paternity zone or University Drive or certain places, more along Mass Ave. But I think there has to be a little bit of both because the market is so strong here for students. It's really peculiar to Amherst. You know, I don't think it's the same in Northampton. I don't think it's the same in other college towns. So I feel like we have to wrestle with that. Um, UMass is building, but I can't say, I, I, don't, I don't think it's all UMass responsibility, right? I feel like we've kind of been in this problem because in the 60s when UMass expanded, we had all these, you know, the town developed and then we put a, then we changed all the zoning. We said no more apartments. And so now every apartment complex is non-compliant because after they were built, we changed the zoning not to allow them anymore. And so, you know, the reflex was, oh my gosh, it's gonna keep happening around town. Let's change the zoning and make it, illegal, which is, you know, so for 40 years, there's been not a lot of multifamily development. For the longest time in Amherst, you know, it was like 50, 60 single family homes or permitted a year. There weren't duplexes, triplexes, or any multi-unit development. And that's changed in the 2000 teens. You know, the pendulum has really swung the other way, but what we're seeing is not the multi-unit development everyone, you know, thinks is happening. It's not for, you know, families or professionals or singles or, you know, anyone. Thanks, Nate. Uh, let's see, we'll do Janet and then Tom and then Andrew. So I definitely think we need to look at strategies for limiting students like the stick. Um, and it could be, you know, 50% affordable, but affordable could be defined as middle income people. Like I remember decades ago, um, Concord built all this housing and when people could apply who were making $100,000 a year, and this is like 20 more than 20 years ago, because they were they were seeing already that they were going to have you know be losing the middle. But I also think we should talk about carrots. And so, you know, getting back to um, Doug's original idea of taking the kind of low density small apartment complexes 
Like what would be the incentive to build more housing, you know, you know, 50% for families, or if it's all students already, just more students. And I also wonder, um, you know, what can we bring as carrots? But also I wonder in terms of your problem, like, is there a way of doing phasing? Like, you know, what if they just took one section of the apartments and they were three stories or three and a half stories? You know, they make their money there. They're not like going, okay, we're gonna make this a blank slate. Cause I think, I wonder if we could talk to people and say, is that, you know, a reasonable way to go? And is there enough money in that for you to want to do that? Okay, you pass the pass it. Um, sorry, I just wanted to comment on the um, the idea that students can live and stay on campus has a really detrimental effect on the commercial district downtown, and that when UMass built its wonderful new food center on campus, every business. Every food business in Amherst suffered dearly for a really long time until that business kind of slowly came back. So I think we also have to be, we want students to be scattered in the neighborhood. We want that to be part of the community. So I think we need to be aware that they feed the, the, the people who work in this community also. So we have to find that balance. I think Nate was just talking about, you know, we have to do a little of both. So I think we can't be exclusionary. I think we have to find a, a balanced practice to do that because I think our community relies on that um, as part of their income. So. Uh, Andrew was next. Thanks, Doug. I, I actually, my comments were kind of similar to what Tom was saying. I think um, I'm worried just some of our conversations sound like we are anti-student and they're the enemy when they're the driving force of our economy. So we should, you know, we should be cognizant of that. Um, I do think, uh, Karin, how you mentioned, you know, the university developing along, I think there's, there's, it would seem that there's ample opportunity for more dorms to be added, but we also have, I guess what I'm not, something I'm not clear about is the relationship between, you know, the university in Amherst and the university with Hadley, because seems like a lot of that empty land is actually in Hadley, not in Amherst. Um, certainly, if you're looking to develop along, right, um, Bruce is pointing to University Drive. If you're looking to develop around there, that's where it's sort of the um, endless uh, fields are, that maybe there's an opportunity to build around the football stadium, as, a, you know, as an example. But um, I, I love having students around town. You know, I, I, we have we have had some periodically on my street and I enjoy the energy that they bring. And so, again, I, I don't know that we hear that enough um, in this forum that um, there is a lot of great benefit that they provide and, and having them interspersed within the community is really a wonderful thing. Okay, Karen. I agree totally. I always said that the only place I wanted to live was the university town, obviously. I mean, my husband teaches there, my kids all go there, my daughter teaches there. There, I've always had students that have lived with us. It's this, what I'm talking about is really the balance. And so if I found it extreme, it was only because of the lack of balance that this is causing. It's such a grievous sort of over sort of charged market for them that I see the rest of town being kind of in danger of leaving the people around me in the center of town. My neighbor for the first time said to me, this is the first time that he's really thought he lives on Lincoln Avenue. They've been thinking about moving because of what is happening. That's, I see it all around me, the young families, my daughter with her four-year-old son. These are the people that we're losing. So if I sound so emotional and extreme, it's only because the balance is gone. Obviously I care about, you know, the students and I, I do think they have to come downtown. I, I, I go to those places to eat too in the center. They have very good food. But um, we have to somehow find, as you said, a strategy that we don't lose the town because of this influx of massive amounts of students. <clears throat> okay, Karen. Janet. I just wanna speak in praise of the UMass grads that were in the house next to me in their speed metal band, which fortunately practiced in the basement. But um, so I, I, you know, there had there are rental units in my house in my neighborhood, but not many. But I wonder if we could look at University Drive really closely because I know um, 
I wonder if we could, if you could pull up on the map and we could talk about it. Like I, I do think it's do a great approval. place for student right. housing, but it also has the arbors, which is, um, you know, obviously it's a housing for. Um, I think we should just. I wonder if we can just. I don't know. I didn't realize you can go so deep, but I just wonder if we could look at it because there's a lot of. There's a lot of single, I know there's a lot of wetlands there because Chris has mentioned that, but there's also a lot of just single story buildings like the post office, the little bicycle shop, the pizza place. And I always just think like, why can't that go up or get bigger? And then it has like the weirdest configuration of streets. Like someone told me, I think Harvey Allen said that the idea was to create a boulevard in the middle of University Drive. And instead we have two parallel streets with these awkward- Chris, why don't you- Give us the history on why the the parallel street on University Drive is there. Um, originally, that was supposed to be a road that went all the way through to South Amherst, and it was going to go, um, you know, con continue on where it goes across Route Nine and where the one one, one University, University Drive is now. It was going to just keep going straight. So it was envisioned to be kind of like I won't say a highway, but sort of like a limited access highway. And they only allowed six um, access points along the area between Amity Street and Route 9. And so in order to have access to all of the side properties, they need to, needed to have that um, strange access road on, this, on the west side um, because they couldn't have access off the divided road. It isn't really Is divided. that a deed restriction? Uh, or, it is. It or... is and, and I think, didn't town council have to approve the curb cut for 70 University Drive or something? Yes, either town council or town meeting had to, town had meeting, to approve that. that yes, we had okay. to go through a process to get that. So is there a process each time to add a cur curb cut? I think there and, would but be. But it's allowable yeah. if the town If the town it. agrees to that to doing that, yes, but it's okay. not as, it's not simple. Okay. So the, the I mean, you've got, the pot shop on the corner at Amity Street, and then what I think of as kind of a little legal office with the Zomek legal office in it and a, maybe a real estate firm in there. And then you got another pot shop and then the, the old printing house with, that has the pizza joint and the, the bike shop. And, and then there's the little looks like a little bank that's empty right next to the Slobody building. And that, so that's, that's obviously an office building. And then you've got the post office and then you've got the mall and um, kind of the area between the, the mall building and the street. I was kind of thinking, well, you know, if you had a 80 foot overlay right along the street, you could put a, Put, put a four or five story housing block in front of big Y um, and, and turn it into being more of an urban, uh, you know, maybe a mixed use building with an actual street edge right on University Drive. And across from that, you know, you've got the urgent care center on the corner. And then I'm gonna not know these as well. Um, that's like an extended care home um, and then there's the large extended care home that's farther back. Uh, yeah, that one looks like the Pentagon. Um, and then there's the 100 University Drive little square office building that's only two stories. That's another lot where that's kind of underutilized. If it were to be in more demand, uh, you could probably have a little more something built up along that, you know, along that lot. And then you've got the wetlands going no north, and then I think that this map doesn't show the new 70 University Drive building. It's uh, short, just short of the mall where Savannah's is too. So it's a little out of date. Um, I would not wanna do something that threatened the kind of medical complex that we've got on that corner. I mean, I think they're there partly because that's what we allowed, but also because that's a pretty good place to get in an ambulance if you need to go to Cooley Dickinson. So I, I kind of like keeping that as our little, in town medical corner. Um, but it seemed to me there were a couple of air spots where if we wanted to kind of shoehorn in some more housing, it wouldn't be impossible, I guess. Um, 
you know, even the, the mall up at the north in the BL there, uh, you know, if, if the financial incentives were right, the folks that own the hangar and the greenfield savings might consider building more there or instead. Okay, Tom. I just had a quick comment. You, you brought something up the other day when we were talking about duplexes and triplexes and, and Mandy Joe's proposal. Um, and it had to do with um, thinking about how we might treat things along certain main roads or thoroughfares as opposed to how we might think about those zones. And, and this seems like one of those places where University Drive might have multiple zones that are happening there, but there's an overlay zone because this is one of those thoroughfares and it's a setback. However many feet from the road can be developed as X, Y, Z. And the same thing I think can happen down where we were talking about um, in South Amherst on Route 9, um, Belcher Town Belcher Road, Town Road um, that that's a zone where you can imagine, okay, give me however many feet back from the road on either side, that's a new zone, you know, overlay zone. And I, I think that that logic makes a lot of sense for a lot of places um, uh, in our town because I think you're right. They're, they've been underdeveloped over time and we need to give some incentive for those things to start to grow some density. So I, it's I, just a, a thought process. I first that. thought about that with when we were thinking, looking at the RN and how it's so varied and some of them are really on major roads and some of them are not. When I think about the historical sort of urban condition of Amherst, I think about the streetcar and what the streetcar route was, which I think was from North Pleasant Street near the university down through downtown all the way to where the DPW is now as kind of the original urban spine of the, of the town. And, um, you know, obviously I wouldn't want to allow the area and that creates the Amherst College image to get completely redone. To me, I mean, that's kind of, if we value Amherst College as a, an essential part of the image of the, of the town and the fact that the, the town image is important to Amherst College to attract people, it's like, oh, I'm coming to the quintessential New England town. That's the area to keep the, the essential New England town. But the other areas of town, I'm, I'm less uh, attached to. Right. Right. You're, you've left that zone, right? You're not in front of the Dickinson house anymore. Yeah. And is the south side of College Street actually not owned by Amherst College? Parts of it are owned by Amherst College and parts of it are owned privately. It's also very wet, the south side of College Street, yes. Okay, I have always assumed that that was Amherst College land and it was just gonna be undeveloped forever. So that's, that's an interesting uh, information. Bruce. Andrew, could you just slide back to the uh, University Drive in for a minute? Because I just want to ask a question related to that uh, area. Doug, you, you, you were giving a, a broad uh, and, and well-informed, I think, uh, summary as we go up. But on the east side of uh, University Drive there, that whole zone is an office park, correct? So, and, and I seem to remember from 25 years ago on this board, we were one of our priorities then was to maximize the opportunity for the kind of development that we believed was going to generate more taxes and that the town being uh, very poor in that direction would uh, then anyway have uh, fought tooth and nail not to give up uh, a zone that was attractive to that. So I imagine that that, that would be still germane or how, how, how does how does that zone affect uh, what you were saying so far as that side of the road is concerned? Well, I was kind of taking the same approach that Nate was describing where let's figure out what we want to do and then figure out how to do it. So I wasn't, I, I, I feel like the R&D that's on the west side of University Drive has really never panned out, right? I mean, what, what, research and development office parks happened in that area? Nothing. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, 
one early in my time on the planning board, there was wasn't there con, wasn't there some project that was going to happen in North Amherst that was going to be an R and D? Was it the eruptor? And, and, and then it went away. But it's like it was like the only thing that I've ever heard of that was actually an R and D initiative in this town. Uh, Chris seems to have some information about what's well, happened to R and D in Amherst. The reason the R and D was established on the west side of University Drive is because there actually was a business that went into that building that is this sort of pink and blue. It belongs to the Slobody family. Oh, so one hundred and one University next to the post office. Yes. Yeah, so in there, there was a uh, a business that did. Um, they turned something that came out of the soil into um, oil. I forget exactly. It was di oh. digesting something and turning it into oil. So Amherst thought, oh boy, this is going to really be great. And they're going to you know, grow and we're going to be able to keep them here. Well, it turned out that they did grow and they went east. They went towards Boston. So uh -huh. you know, they had to get more people to work for them in a bigger place, whatever. So that's why that R&D zone was established there to allow that to occur. And it is true that we've had a hard time getting R&D to come to Amherst in general. Well, the, the floor plates of all the built, those buildings are so small. It's like R&D, you think you need a warehouse, right? You need a lot of room to expand and do things you don't even know about that you want to do today. Um, Janet. So this, this is a great topic because you know, if someone's going to build the big research and development facilities, they're probably going to go to Holyoke because there's tons of space and it's cheap energy and, um, you know, it's not going to be here. And so, you know, in a way we should focus on our strengths and, you know, sort of stick to our knitting because what you see is what we have. And, um, you know, we need housing, we need businesses, we need a nursing home, we need medical facilities. You know, I, but I would say putting flexible zoning there that would allow different things, not prescribed like on this lot, you have to have a research facility, but to open it up. In, in university um, in SUNY Binghamton, they have a huge um, housing, student housing thing right behind the, this whole kind of strip development of grocery stores. Remarkably no coffee shop anywhere you could find, which is my search, but that, that whole kind of, the whole shopping area is a great place for students and behind it was a bunch of housing. And maybe that does put us into Hadley, but that's okay too. You know, I mean, we, we need to sort of look at things regionally also. Well, uh, your regional comment sort of reminds me of a, a lot of the concerns we heard when we started talking about the solar moratorium proposal last year and how everybody was worried about doing solar on farmland or on woodland. Um, so personally, I cringe every time I see a new, another single family house go up in Hadley. It's like, that is such good farmland. And it, someday we're gonna not be able to import things from California to, to eat. And so personally, I'd rather build more in Amherst where not on our farmland and most of our town is not really great farmland. Um, I'd rather build it here and let Hadley be rural. So that's part of where I'm coming from. Uh, Bruce, you'd asked about the office park zone on the east side of, of University Drive. Okay, I thought I'd talk mostly about the R&D side. Um, Okay, okay, that was enough. Okay, great. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So the Brown is now um, 70 University Drive, 36 apartments, and uh, it's in a mixed use building. And just north of that is Savannah's. So that whole thing has been developed. We have a problem because we have a, a flight of Amherst um, that for imaging that was done in 2019, but our maps are all based on 2009. So there's been a lot of development in the last X number of years that we don't show on our maps. The other thing is I want to say about this is that the BL zoning district was extended towards the south 
Mm -hmm. um, it was extended to that building that's I think called the Lincoln Paper Company building, that square one in, on the right. Um, so that whole brown area and the little white area north of that is now BL, although it doesn't show that on this map. Okay, all right. Could, could, Andrew, could you also scroll down onto Route 9? Because we go a little bit west and we've got some housing. We've got the new one University Drive. I guess I was just wondering if there was any opportunity on the south side of Route 9, kind of between the railroad and the Hadley line. Chris? That's also very wet, that whole area um, from one university drive south. It's, it's really okay. not land that can be built upon. Okay. All right. So it's 20 minutes, after, about 20 minutes after eight. Um, we scheduled this meeting for two hours. So we have about 40 minutes left if we wanna continue. Um, are there are there more uh, thoughts people wanted to have tonight? Um, you know, we can have a conversation in a future planning board meeting about whether we want to try to follow up on any of these areas or not. Um, Bruce, I'm not sure how much to say about this. I don't really know much, but uh, I know that um, because uh, the North Amherst, in North Amherst, the District 1 Neighborhood uh, Association, which is, I guess, a pretty active uh, uh, neighborhood group that uh, arose after the, uh, the council was, uh, basically, the districts were created. And I know that uh, donors, they call themselves, are, are talking pretty regularly with uh, Cinder Jones and, uh, and, and, and her, uh, as everybody knows, the, the, there's a fair amount of land, and uh, Cinder's become uh, quite thoughtful about housing and various types of housing. And I can't speak for her, and I wouldn't even try. But I think we ought to recognize, as we are talking about housing in Amherst, that there's a player in North Amherst who owns land and is uh, has incentive to create housing. So. Um, just let's just recognize that and uh, and see how uh, see what happens and to what extent uh, we should or can engage. Okay, Karen. Um, I wonder. I wonder if we should if we should zero in on one of these spots that you mentioned, Doug. Uh, rather than, I mean, this was good because it's so broad. But if we're really going to make progress should we sort of zero in on one spot and see what we can do to, to drive it further? Well, I think it partly it will depend on how, how we think we can make progress. And part of that is how much time the staff would have to help us versus having some of us uh, trying to come up with a zoning proposal of our own. Um, and You know, we. Anyway, that's that's where I would start. And you know, this was built tonight as a just a discussion. So I'm actually a little bit leery about trying to make any decisions tonight because the public really wasn't warned <laughs> that we might make a decision. <laughs> so, right. So okay. So I see Janet's hand and I see Tom's hand. So I really, I think this has been a great discussion and I, I really appreciate what people are saying and just sitting around and talking. Um, and I, I would love to do a discussion or maybe not a two hour meeting about design standards, and which sounds like the most boring thing. And you know, when I look at the um, housing production plan, I like the scale of these buildings, but they all look the same to me in a, in a way. It's like the same kind of storefront over and over again. And it looks like a place I wouldn't really want to go. And so there are like village center design standards like that different places. And I wonder if we could just have a meeting and kind of look at different d design standards over like the physical depiction and say, oh, we want, the, we want that for Amherst or for a village thing or downtown. Cause I think that's, 
you know, like getting even just getting a sense of what it could look like. And I don't mean to have everything look like a colonial house where, you know, everything's white with a black shutter, but, you know, even innovative kind of buildings need to come in and things. But I think a lot of what we are getting is just like the same building over and over again, or the same, or what I see is just like, I, it's like, you know, I could be here that you could be that you could say that's Amherst, but I could name 25 other places it could be. And I think the sense of uniqueness we have in the downtown is what we keep on showing and we all like. And so how can we recreate that in the different village centers? And I would make a plea for East Amherst Village Center, which is kind of a really unattractive area that's really hard to walk around. Okay. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I was just gonna say, if we're not making decisions, we might wanna just come away with a strategy. You know, kind of what are two things we wanna tackle? How do we go about that and you know, stuff like that? So you know, that even, well, we could take two sides of the coin. Where, where would we want to concentrate and limit students yeah. to be? And where would we want to try to create more yeah. mixed occupancy, you know, civic life? Yeah. And what, what would that look like? So we would want to, we would need the planning board to do work on it, right? So there, there is a transfer of labor that happens. I guess that's the question. Like, what does that process look like? Does it require us to do work? Could we walk away, take two or three weeks, to do some stuff on our own, whatever the capacity of it is? Like well, I mean, we know that a couple of town councilors can come up and, with a zoning proposal, mm -hmm. uh, and we could do the same thing. Um, you know, I think one of the I, I hope that it's a value to at least town council, if not CRC, for us to be having these conversations. Yeah. It, it, it might actually give them a little bit more of an opening to feel like there's a little bit of broader support for talking about this, about going in this direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as I know, one or two counselors can get together and do things without and come up with a proposal without violating open meeting law, right? Um, you got to be really careful not to be, you know, not to be not to be a quorum. <laughs> but you know, a couple of people could come up with something and bring it to a meeting, um, it, whether it's actually zoning or whether it's just here's a vision for what it might be, and here, and we don't know how you would do it. So, Nate. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I do like the idea of trying to come up, come, you know, have some takeaways from this. Um, you know, there is the new building on Mass Ave, and we haven't really talked about it, but it, it's pretty big, right? So, I mean, some of it would be, do we like that size, that style, the height? You know, we have One East Pleasant, we have Kendrick Place, we have others downtown. And I think, you know, I agree with Janet, you know, I, it's on me a little bit with the design standards, but, you know, the way we define height of a building, and then we allow utilities on top with screening, you know, essentially a building can be 15 feet taller than what we're allowing because of how we define the height and it and it, it has an impact a visual impact and so you know you know I, I guess some of it is you know if what we're taking away from this is you know what do we like in terms of what we're seeing height density massing and we have an example right now being built on mass ave that's you know pretty substantial and it's like is that okay i haven't heard a lot i haven't heard a lot actually negative or positive about it and it's like well could we have two more of those along mass ave and that's a huge help to housing and you know why not? I mean, but so I haven't heard from many people. I haven't heard, you know, sometimes people will call and be concerned um, with certain projects. And I haven't heard much either way about that one. And, you know, it's, it's a really massive building, buildings going in. Um, so to me, that's, you know, that's the upper end of what I'm thinking about in terms of scale and density. And then, you know, it's down to like I was saying, like two stories, three stories in village centers, maybe, you know, a story under the roof or something, but um, not incredibly dense like that in many places at all. I feel like that's, an extreme example, but I love to consider where could we allow that type of housing? Where is it appropriate to have really dense multifamily? And let's think of other areas to have different types of housing. The, on, the only community comment I've heard was from someone in the Fearing Street who was worried about the noise uh, potentially coming out of that U-shaped structure. Um, let's see, Chris? I would love to look at the East Amherst Village Center. That's been kind of in our 
you know, idea of things that we need to look at. And I think that there's a support for that. And there aren't really dense single family neighborhoods around there that would object to things happening in that village center. And there's already a lot of things that are happening. Amir Mikchi is building a building now. He has plans for building one across the street from there. We just saw the um, 20 Belcher Town Road Service Net project go through. So I think there's a lot of, um, what? Uh, momentum. Momentum, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, and, you know, the Fort River School and Janet mentioned the community gardens. So I think um, the East Amherst Village Center is really a place that is, is ripe for development and is ripe for help. Tom? Yeah, and I think it could also be a case study for what we might do in, in other village centers. And I think Pomeroy is another opportunity. And I think it's behind in terms of development compared to where East Amherst Village is, but it definitely has the potential to become another center like that. And, and if it has the right design guidelines and zoning that it could actually grow and prosper. Thanks, Doug. Um, agree with those in terms of East uh, Amherst and Pomeroy being uh, some great starting points. And then relative to the, the student question, um, you know, I, I, I would just point out as well, the university is getting a new chancellor this fall. I don't know to what extent um, or how the town interacts with the school, but just with some new leadership, probably a good opportunity to make sure we've got conversations going relative to the interest. But um, the areas, Doug, that you pointed out at the beginning, um, Puffton, North Village, seems like a logical spot. I mean, you've got synergy with the university. I don't know that anybody except for students are going to want to live there anyway. Um, so if we think of this as kind of two zones, we've got maybe East Amherst as a logical spot for um, some of those design standards, you know, testing some of the waters, building something that may be more um, of more interest to uh, and maybe more accessible to uh, workforce populations and then sort of north of the university being really more geared towards trying to, to make this more, um, make it able to, to be able to build some greater student density in the housing. I guess with the north of the university area that would, would we want to limit that area to students or would we wanna make it an area that's intended for students? But if there are others that wanna live there, would that be prohibited? Um, because I, I don't I don't know who's living there now, and maybe they are mostly or maybe they're entirely students. But but say there's you know a few just low income people that this is where they want to live, and it's on a bus route, and it's close to where they work at the dining hall at UMass or whatever. Is that a problem? As I was saying those words, I, I wanted to take them back. Um, I, I know, I mean, I, 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 I grew up in town. I had, um, I had some very good friends who grew up in those apartments. And yeah, it, it is, you know, it's not just students who live there for sure. And one of the reasons why maybe because of affordability of those units, so. Well, I also remember when the university was taking down North Village before the recent construction, there was at least one really moving uh, sort of memoir article in the Gazette by a guy who had grown up in North Village. And it wasn't that they were all poor or it wasn't that they were all in small apartments. It was that there were all these kids and they were all from all over the world. And it was a wonderful experience for him. So you just never know what, what people value and it's, it varies, yeah. Everybody took care of each other, right? Yeah, okay. Janet. Um, I wanna say two unrelated things. One of them is about the East Amherst Village Center is Amherst has great soil. Like we have prime and soils and soils of you know, statewide importance. So Hadley has amazing soils, but we have great soils too. And what I like about East Amherst Village Center is it's got farms all around it. And so there's, um, and there's more cultivation now than there was 20 years ago. And um, so I would love as a kind of a um, stake in the ground to say, 
no more conversion of farmland in that area, but we can put density around it. There's, you know, I get a lot of my vegetables just driving home. And um, so there, there's more farming going on, you know, the Amherst, um, uh, it, I remember it was a um, nursery, but it's now turned into, you know, farming stuff. Miss, the Wentworth family is farming. And then the, you know, there's just more farms and more food. And I think, can we preserve that and do some really good village center kind of zoning or changes there, making it more livable and walkable. But I wonder with the apartment complexes is let's go talk, maybe that could be a separate thing. Like, what do you do with these very low density apartment complexes? How do you keep that sense of community, but build it up? And I think that's a planning process of talking to the people there and asking them what they would like to see, what they wanna preserve. And then we think, oh, what can you do? And then talk obviously to the owners or any builders like, how could you make some money doing this without with protecting that? And I think that would be sort of not a, we can do this in a few meetings, but to talk to the people who live there and see, you know, what would they like to see, you know, including the owners. Okay, thanks, Janet. Uh, I see one public hand that has been raised for a little while from Pam Rooney. Could, could you have three minutes? Uh, yep, Pam Rooney, thank you for letting me speak again. Um, I'm very, very happy to hear the conversation tonight, and I appreciate you looking at different parts of town, thinking about what the potential is for those areas. <clears throat> I think it's a much wiser approach than what we've been reacting to, which is a broad sweeping zoning proposal that people are spending a lot of time and energy trying to analyze. And this, to me, is where um, really zoning conversations should originate in the brainstorming of the six to nine, 10 people um, sitting around the table, thinking about these things holistically rather than um, sort of piecemeal. So um, I want to, as liaison to town council will also support strongly um, this effort. I. I hesitate to ask staff what their what their staffing load is and their workload and their ability to shepherd this along, but I think with a group willing, as you all seem to be, to take on some of the uh, some of the burden, um, I'm very excited about the possibility of this, and I and I would love to hear this sort of I don't know how you I don't know how you sort of summarize but I think someone could probably do a good job of summarizing this approach as opposed to um, uh, what's trying to happen now. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Bruce. Um, I just want to ask what's here. Um, uh, Andrew, can you bring that up and then? It's basically the uh, a big blank RN between Strong Street and uh, and Tilden. It's basically uh, the reason I'm asking is uh, it's uh, it could be an extension of the uh, RF zone. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, Chris Riddle there lives there. Yes, I I I, I sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> That's Tilden. Uh, oh, sorry. Isn't that? Uh, no, that's in there. Well, the, the Olympia Oaks. Oh, Olympia Oaks is back here. Yeah, yes. But it was. It's a big blank area, and the reason. Yes. Yeah. I was. I was just thinking that that uh, the, the the one zone that we have in town that is uh, designated for the type of housing uh, for students at least that we're talking about is that uh, RF zone. But uh, part of the problem is that um, although there's parcels and so forth there, there's uh, most of the parking or all of the parking is being uh, put, to a, uh, put to use, so to speak. So trying to find, um, trying to en enable that area to become uh, more usefully exploited for um, housing. I was just thinking what, what, what opportunities exist beyond the Browns that's already there. And there's this big white 
gap in the map, which looks very interesting. I just wanted to comment um, in response to Bruce that the RF zone is mostly owned by the university. There are really just two parcels there that are privately owned. And those are both, one of them was developed by Archipelago and the other one is about to be developed by Archipelago. So there's really not much, even though it looks like there's a lot of land up there, there's not much that can actually be developed, unfortunately. But I also wanted to say something not uh, with regard to what Bruce said, I wanted to say that I think that the conversation here that we've had tonight is very much in support of, of our master plan because we're looking at areas that are already developed and we're thinking about how could we add density there. We're not looking out into the hinterlands and thinking about how we can sort of scatter more housing out in those hinterlands, which I don't think we want to do. So I, I'm really supportive of this conversation tonight. Thank you. Go ahead, Janet. We use that, that one in front of you. Could the could the RF be a public private partnership? You know, another series of dorms, you know. I just I think it UMass. depends how the university wanted to want what it what it wanted to do with it. I think we heard when Archipelago was here talking to us about their project they're doing now that a cert, a pretty good number of the parcels around that street are reserved for parking for the for you know or or recreation whatever that means so that there's some deed restriction on how that area is built out that you know it could unless archipelago agreed and they changed you know the, the deed arrangement um there, there's going to need to stay some parking in that area karen Does the planning board uh, communicate with, say, the new chancellor or something like this to say, how can we brainstorm to attack some of these uh, things? Like, could we help you with a private hub, you know, um, putting in more high density dorms into this area? We would pay for them and we would profit, but you would give us the land. Are we in, in communication with them? Um. Chris, correct every, anything I'm about to say. Um, it's my experience that the planning board doesn't communicate really with anyone other than the town staff and CRC and just town council. Um, so it's through the town, you know, authorities, let's say, that the town communicates with the university. So, I think it would be un unlikely that we would ever have a conversation with the chancellor unless the, the chancellor showed up at a meeting and wanted to make a public comment, um, I, which is not impossible. Uh, <laughs> but but Tom Tom would have to meet and moderate that that meeting that night. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, the the. the one of the reasons that I haven't felt that, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna take a digression and come back. Uh, today, uh, I received from Chris uh, a, another email from someone who is claiming that I have a conflict of interest because I work for the university, but I'm on this planning board. And I've had two previous instances where someone made a complaint and um, I have talked to the state ethics board both times and explained that, first of all, the university is not subject to any of our local zoning. So on state land, they can do what they want and they never have to come to the planning board. So in that sense, I don't have a conflict participating in these conversations because they're never gonna affect state land. So conversely, in my job, I'm working on state land and planning state land, which is never gonna directly impact town land. Now, 
are there indirect relationships between them? Yes, but I'm not prohibited as a person to wear both of those hats since there isn't a lot, any direct response. So I, to come back to your, to your question, anything we propose really should be about town land that we can do zoning on that somebody might actually uh, have to pay attention to, right? I mean, we could do a zoning proposal for UMass's land and they won't bother to even read it, right? Um, so I think we're better off dealing with the things we can control and letting the town or letting the UMass deal with the things they can control. And so, and then the conversation is really between the town council and the town manager and you know the, the university's leadership, however, the university wants to have whoever it wants to have talked for them. I mean, I was on the UTAC committee eight or 10 years ago for a while as a UMass representative. And there were people from the town who were in that conversation too. And the reason I was allowed, I was nominated to be there at the time as a UMass person. So the, the university chooses who they wanna have in what conversations. Um, and um, so, you know, I mean, if the planning board had something it wanted to say, I think we could communicate to the town council and if they endorsed it, they might say to the town manager, hey, would you go talk to the chancellor or whoever it is in university relations that has those types of conversations. So we, we originate sort of ideas and then people hopefully support them and they can carry them to wherever they need to go. I just wanted to mention that uh, this was important enough, this, this problem of the uh, housing spilling over and having a chance, you know, perhaps being very detrimental to the town, how would they solve it? And both of them said they had no idea how to solve it. <laughs> but it seems like the, uh, it's there and it has to be addressed, certainly. Well, it's, a, it's not an uncommon problem in college towns. <laughs> So we are an independent board and we don't, we don't have an overseer, you know, um, so, but yes, Chris is our overseer. actually Chris, Chris, I mean, so we're an independent board created by stake law. We have all these different things that we can do. And I, I think that it'd be great to talk about what we're talking about, but not just to, we don't have to go through, you know, certain channels and things like that. But I do think that how do we elevate this conversation or reach out? Like maybe we could have the planners from UMass say, Here's, you know, maybe we should meet with them saying, what's your housing plan for the next five or 10 years? Because this is kind of a best. Well, I, I will say yeah. my experience as an employee is that the university is very deliberate about who they have speak for them with the town. So you could make that request. And I'm not sure that the planners would be the ones that would show up at the conversation. Yeah, okay, so just sort of but like exchanging ideas and sort of informal, but Bruce, I was also wondering like, what's the status of your, your research about college towns and solutions and things like that? Because I think that would be a great thing to talk about too. You mean now? You've had a, you've had a week, Bruce. It's, it's, uh... The, the, the conversation tonight has been mostly about large scale, um, uh, higher density and how to find it and locate it. And uh, what I'm doing is more related to what the uh, proposal of um, Andy Joe, Andy Joe had, and Pat Patricia, which is uh, starts with duplexes, adds proposed triplexes, and then converted dwellings and townhouses and stops there. And, and, um, if I make that just for a moment, well, what I'm intending to do, uh, because typically um, people like me will say, well, we should do something about this as a, as a comment, either as a public comment or as a comment as a member of a board. And then with the best will in the world, not much else happens. 
or because I'm a retired gentleman or a person, I guess I should say, um, clearly an old person, um, I, I think I can put some time in. So I've offered and discussed this with Nate and with uh, Chris, but with none, none of the rest of you really, um, because I, I didn't know whether I'd do it. And I thought, well, I'll talk to you guys when I've done it. That's probably appropriate because if I don't do it, it's just moot. But what I'm proposing to do is identify 12 to 15 towns that are similar across the country to this, small towns like Amherst. I'm doing it on the basis of proportion uh, ratio of population, uh, total population to student population, 1.5 to 3 uh, on relation to median age, somewhere between 22 and 26. Um, uh, own ownership around 50%. And, and one other criteria that slips my mind for the moment, but I've got 15. And then I've got 10 questions that I'll ask uh, the playing directors of, and others, two or three others from each of those 15 towns. And Nate and Chris have helped me with those questions generally. The next step, which I'm halfway through, is uh, looking at each of those towns and downloading um, essentially comprehensive plans from each of those towns, housing studies, and any, any, any other pieces of uh, regulatory data or that, that are conspicuous, but mostly comp plans that I can then read, particularly the housing sections of, and understand something more specific about those towns that will allow me to focus those general questions and specific questions for each town. And I'm gonna look at um, you know, Google and so forth so I can get a general sense of the uh, looks like from the air because there's going to be some differences there that might trigger some questions as well. And and then when I get back from the Bahamas and phones can be used, I'll um, I'll make 30 or 40 phone calls. And I expect to do that in the month of April. And uh, and I'll I'll write all that up, what I find. But essentially, I'm the kind of questions I'm asking is: Does your town uh, designate a student? A residential use, student home, or some use like that. And if it does, what is the definition of that use? And do you have minimum distance type regulations? Uh, do you have uh, um, rental license fees? And, 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 and are they calibrated to equally across all rentals, or do they uh, have sliding scales depending on the type of rental and nuisance houses defined? and uh, a few other things like that, basically, uh, probably add a couple more, Nate, because you remembered them. But that's what I want to do. I want to answer all those questions and come back then with some uh, basic understanding of how um, we might be able to get a better and more comfortable engagement with um, student accommodations, and particularly at the lower end of the scale. Thank you, Bruce. So we have, we have, we have about eight minutes left. Chris, you just raised your hand. Did you want to add to what Bruce was saying? I just wanted to say, um, you know, in response to what Janet was asking before, we don't communicate directly with the university. Town staff doesn't. The um, town manager does. But the town manager learns a lot from, um, oh, that was Karen's question. I'm sorry. Um, from our conversations and from talking to, to us planners and watching the planning board meetings once in a while and here's the conversation and then he reads the paper and sees what's being talked about in the gazette and the amherst indy and that is also read by people at the university and so there's kind of a groundswell of you know ideas that comes forward and that's kind of what i was getting at before because you know 15 or 20 years ago people started talking about well why can't umass build more housing on on their campus well, they don't have enough money to do that. Well, then what about public-private pri public -private partnerships? And then people were talking about that. And you know, I, I just remember the kind of growing conversation and eventually UMass went to the state, I guess, to, to have it determined whether they could do public-private partnerships. And it came out that they could do those. And so even though it took a really long time to get to that point, I think it kind of grew out of conversations that the planning board was having back then and conversations that the select board was having. So it's, um, it's kind of a collective effort, even though we're not going and talking to the chancellor, 
um, this group. It, um, it kind of all filters into the university mindset and affects decisions that they make. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> all right. So maybe we're done for tonight. We can stop a few minutes early and thank you for thank you all for coming. Uh, let me see for Are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment if we can make the technology work? I do not see any new hands. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's one. Janet Keller, Pam Field Sadler. Do you think you can bring what Janet Keller speak or not? All right, Janet, we think you have the ability Janet, to speak. Yeah, um, I just wanted to thank you for uh, a very thoughtful and um, a, it was a, a great conversation and I appreciate it very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Janet. Okay, I think we are finished for tonight. The time on my analog watch is not 8.56. <laughs> so we are adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>